Welcome to episode 40 of the Serious About Security podcast for May 21st, 2013, brought to you by the Center for Education and Research and Information Assurance and Security, or Sirius at Purdue University. I'm Preston Wiley, and I'm joined today by Keith Watson and Mike Hill, and Keith has the first article for this week. All right, so I thought we'd talk a little bit about uh, privacy in Bloomberg terminals, and uh, Bloomberg terminals are an electronic uh, resource used by financial services companies to look up uh, stock information, equities, commodities, any sort of trading activity they can do through the terminals as well. And Bloomberg, the company, sells or, or basically leases these, uh, these Bloomberg terminals to roughly $20,000 per terminal per year. Um, to financial services companies so that they can look up information and execute trades, that sort of thing. Where the problem comes in is that Bloomberg also owns another service called Bloomberg News, which is basically their financial news reporting arm of the company. And the privacy breach that we're specifically looking at is the fact that the Bloomberg News reporters were able to access some information about subscribers using Bloomberg terminals. Now, uh, from what's been reported, it appears that they could get login details about subscribers, so they could find out when they logged into their terminal, not necessarily what they did, but whether they had logged in recently, and some contact information is available as part of the subscriber information there. So this became a problem because some of the journalists from Bloomberg News were asking very you know, interesting questions to some of the financial services industries folks. Uh, uh, there was one instance where a reporter asked about whether uh, a, a couple of employees had been fired because they hadn't logged into their Bloomberg terminals in a while. There's another incident of uh, trying to determine if a particular executive um, had been let go uh, because he had not shown up, he had not logged into his terminal in a while. And so the question now is what does Bloomberg know, Bloomberg News know about its subscribers to its financial data? And this is a real issue because Traders don't want to tip their hand as to what they're looking at, what they're interested in purchasing, uh, you know, equities or stocks in certain companies because that might uh, reveal too much about what's going on, change the price targets they're looking for, you know, executing trades at. And so we have a little problem here with Bloomberg because one side of the house provides a, a, a lot of fairly confidential information to traders. And then another part is about, you know, basically exposing information about what's going on in the financial markets through their reporting service. And so this is an interesting uh, conflict within the organization. And I thought this would be a great thing to talk about today. Well, one thing I found really interesting in this article, Keith, um, was that um, the editor-in-chief of Bloomberg News said that reporters have had this kind of access to login data since the 90s. And um, that's, a, that's a long time to have that kind of access. And, and I also think about how different computers and the Internet and in the world was in the 90s versus now. Uh, so I think this is one of those one of those items where this was initially implemented. No one really understood, you know, um, the, the risk and it's just you know it's just existed all this time it's never really come to the forefront they never really went back and said there should be a separation of privileges here um, I don't know how much of an advantage login data gives and I don't know beyond that what these reporters could get access to um, but this was clearly um, a case where they should have not allowed this to happen just because of the perception that could persist from it well, it seems to me like in the financial uh, industry or the trading thing, uh, trading industry, um, any information is is important. I mean, the 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 difference between uh, the CEO of Apple wearing a blue shirt versus wearing a red shirt could could have an impact on the stock price potentially. 
because maybe they, they, you know, just superstition, you know, when he wears a blue shirt, he delivers good news. When he wears a red shirt, he delivers bad news. Just him walking out on stage with a different color shirt could impact the price of Apple. Um, so um, just minuscule amounts of information can impact um, stock prices. Um, so so I think this is uh, this is... This is a trust. This is definitely a trust issue, and I think that Bloomberg is going to have to rebuild trust um, to their their customers. And the other question is: This is one instance. How many other conflicts of interest are there out there? I mean, the media companies are they're they're they acquire and acquire and acquire, and they have interest everywhere. And I'm sure there's a lot of conflicts of interest that that people are somewhat aware of, but they may not realize how far they go. Right. And and here, let me let me read off some of the information that could be accessed by a Bloomberg user. And this is uh, you on the Bloomberg terminal itself. You can run what's called the Z function and enter the company name of the subscriber and, and pull up a list of subscribers for that particular firm. And then you could look at the background information on an individual subscriber with contact information, when the subscriber logged in, chat information between subscribers and customer service reps, weekly statistics on how often they used a particular function. Now that last one seems very interesting. Um, if you, for example, were doing a lot of uh, investigation on, on government securities, government debt, that might be interesting from a strategy perspective. Something that could be very interesting to, to reporters to say, hey, why are you looking at this particular information? So that that's problematic certainly and but it doesn't also indicate what other information they have access to now, it seems to be that um, part of the strategy of Bloomberg News being fi primarily focused on financial news was to figure out you know what's going on in the marketplace so they actually were encouraged to use their own Bloomberg terminals and so that could be used for them to look up stock information or see what markets are doing or stock prices in general are doing. But with this data, then you're now not looking at general market statistics. You're now looking at individual company strategy, potentially. And so that's a little problematic. And as you mentioned, Preston, trust is critical in this industry, and they violated that. And so it'll be interesting to see if, if there's a big push to move away from Bloomberg terminals and pick up one of their competitors, such as Thomson Reuters, for example. Yeah, well, this seems like a huge oversight, too. Um, it, it's hard for me to believe that this wasn't done intentionally. Uh, it, it just it, it boggles me why those journalists and reporters would have access to that type of information, uh, because that's like an elevated level, privilege level, that they're able to go and, and look at at that type of information versus just using the terminal kind of as a as a regular user. So, um, I, you know, if, if it's just a if it's just a mistake that they're claiming, it's a huge oversight, and someone should have been able to look at this and say, no, 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 there's a real conflict of interest here. We cannot allow um, allow them to have this type of access, and, and we, you know, we should not be encouraging it either. Yeah, well, true, but I also think that if a reporter discovered he had that kind of access, he's not going to go tell somebody. Right, but but and, and that's just and, and that's my that's my whole argument here is they should not have that type of access. Oh, I don't disagree. We, we all know users will do something because they can do it. You know, it's like well, the st the computer didn't stop me from doing it, so I assumed I could delete all the files because it it didn't prevent me from doing that. Sure. Uh, so that's why you got to have some safeguards in place that say, you know, you, you need to have those policies and guidelines well defined that says you cannot do this, and there should be a system in place that prevents them from doing that. Especially with the size of business that we're talking about here, I think they could afford to have those kind of procedures and policies and uh, uh, folks in place that can take care of that. Well, it seems to me, based on the article, and this is just an assumption that it was, it's okay 
until we got caught and now it's not okay anymore uh, type of attitude. Uh, it seems like, to me, it seems like it was it was just standard practice for the news, for Bloomberg News to do this, and some reporter made a comment to somebody that they questioned, like, why would you know that information? And then that's when the, that's when things were, it was dug deeper into to figure right. out what happened. Yeah, and, and there were complaints made by some of the subscribers saying, hey, you, you know, we didn't, we don't appreciate you asking those kind of questions. You have more access than you really should. So that's been noted by some, you know, Goldman Sachs being an example of that. They're like, well, how did you find that out? You shouldn't have known that. And then there were complaints made after that. So, but it doesn't seem like Bloomberg took those seriously. Uh, they just kind of calmed the, that particular subscriber firm down and that was it. So, but uh, yeah, it's it's interesting stuff, especially when you have an organization that on one side of the house is to be open and, and probing for news about what's going on, and another and another side of the house providing sensitive information uh, about what markets are doing. So there's a strange division that should exist, a firewall that should exist between those two corporate entities, and there doesn't appear to be one. All right, so we'll move on to Mike's article. Yes, uh, the article I selected for this week is on uh, uh, Congress asking Google about their uh, privacy policy regarding Google Glass. Um, so uh, for some of our listeners that may not know what Google Glass is, um, Google Glass are these um, eyeglass, you know, they're basically like glasses you can wear that have a web camera and computer kind of built into it. It's really thin uh, where you can interact with it like you do um, like your smartphones and everything so you can capture video by asking Google to Google Glass to capture video or you can snap pictures uh, so you can do all this hands-free um, and right now they're sort of in a I guess I'd call it kind of a beta testing phase it's it's not been released to the mass market yet but they've got a few of them out there where people are trying them out and, and seeing how they work uh, but basically uh, the real advantage is it's hands-free so you don't have to pull out your phone out of your pocket if you want to take a picture or if you want to start recording a video uh, you can do all of that uh, while wearing these these glasses on, on your head. Uh, you can also do, you know, you can look up data. Uh, I watched a little video on it, you know, they, they showed, you know, you're kind of going through the airport and you can see where your terminal is and it gives you some uh, some updated information. So, um, so you know, this is something Google's invested a lot in and, it, it, and it's coming. So Congress uh, basically sent them a letter uh, last week and said, that they would like to talk to them about their privacy policies and how they're going to be different regarding these uh, Google, regarding Google Glass, and um, you know basically uh, the the questions kind of drill down to about uh, how are they going to treat the privacy policies kind of differently than they they do current user data. How are they going to ensure that these you know that this Google Glass is not abused or that sensitive information regarding users. Um, is not being just kind of leaked out there to everyone. So uh, I think it'll be a bit of a challenge c considering how Google Glass works. Uh, but on the other hand, it, it's really no different than kind of walking around with your smartphone and, and doing these kinds of things uh, with, with your smartphone. So um, I wanted to kind of bring this up today and see what, what you guys thought about this and, and how you think Google will respond. Um, well, I think your point about this being similar to a smartphone is is well put because you can walk around with your cell phone, you know, hold it up and say, ooh, you know, shoot video, take pictures, interact with it just as you can with Google Glass. The difference is I'm not wearing it over my eyeglass to do it. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a more, you know, um, functional, uh, in a sense, display and and capture device designed around where your eyes and where your ears are. Um, so it works in, in a sense much better than a cell phone for that purpose. So if you're going to ask those questions about Google Glass, the same questions apply to how you use smartphones too, in a sense. I think the difference in what, they're everybody, what everybody's creeped out about is it may not be obvious that Google Glass is recording you. Whereas it's a little more obvious when I'm holding my camera up. 
my phone and you can see that I'm doing something with it whereas you're wearing the eyeglasses all the time it's not as obvious and so that I think creeps a few people out and that's why yeah, these questions I, I, come up. I was going to say the same thing um, basically it's it's one of those things where you know that you can you can certainly you can certainly set up a, a covert uh, recording operation using various things, but this is just a mass, a covert recording for the masses, essentially. That doesn't require well, any... I, that's what their it, concern is, right? Yeah. I don't yeah. know that you're going to use it that way. You may well, be able to. If you wanted to use it that way, you sure. could use it that way, and, and but, quite easily. Well, yeah, but, you know, when I get my neural implant in... <laughs> Then what, right? Yeah. Well, I, I've not seen Google. I've not actually really seen a pair of Google Glass or, or haven't seen too much on them uh, other than what I saw preparing for this article today. But I, I guess I kind of assume that there would be some kind of indicator, you know, when, when the light's recording. Like right now, I'm no. looking at my computer. There's a light that lights up. No? I don't, I don't believe there is. It's, it's really discreet, huh? It won't. Yes. That, that surprises that's... me a bit, yeah. And that's the idea, I think. Is that's the idea. You discreet. can just do all this covertly. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think they're going to have to. Um, I think they're going to have to do make a strong case, and you know, uh, part of the do no harm. They're going to have to kind of prove how users are going to be protected. Because I, I can see a lot of people not really wanting that. Uh, people walking around with these uh, with these glasses on, where everything's being captured, but. Um, as you said, Keith, though, a lot of what we already do is kind of captured anyway already right. with all the different devices out there and um, cameras and, and streets. You know, there's a lot that's already being captured. But I think having having it get to where somebody can just record everything they're doing throughout the day. Um, I, I don't know. I, I think it's going to be a, I think it's going to be a, a challenge for Google. But I imagine Google's got a, a plan in place because they've pursued this pretty heavily. I think they've invested a lot. So I think they feel they've got um, some kind of answer they can come back with to go ahead and push these things through. Well, it's like your own personal dashboard cam, right? For sure. For you. Yeah. The, in one sense, that's what it is. And and there are lots of other reasons that the the beta tester size is what it is. And I'll point out that a majority of the people who have them right now that are not Google employees are, are developers. And Google's strategy, as far as I can discern, is they want to put it in the hands of the people who are going to write applications for this thing. And so some of them are going to write some very awesome applications that will be very helpful to the people who have Google Glass. And then there will be others who, who don't do that. And so it it's you know, on the shoulders of Google to kind of, you know, have a little more control over the those tor those sorts of apps, too. And I don't know that they've put any effort into that yet because they're more of a, well, let's just put out some awesome tech and see what people can do with it approach. And sometimes it's awesome and sometimes it's a little creepy. And, and, and so we have that issue. Um, but yeah, certainly around here in the Midwest, we're not going to see too many people walking around with these things. You go to the Bay Area in California, you'll see a ton of people, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, I think I think that's a, a, a very true statement. And I think it's like a lot of things. Um, you know, in the right hands used for the right purposes, uh, it's probably a very useful thing. It's probably a very useful tool. But, but in the wrong hands, um, you know, it, it gets really creepy really fast. You know, the, the right. wrong people that would have these could do things very easily. Um, and, and like, you know, around the Midwest, like you said, it, it's going to be pretty obvious because not many people are going to be wearing them and people are going to be suspicious. But you go out into a large populated area and, you know, 50, 60 percent of the people are walking around with it. It's not so obvious that, you know, that who the bad guys are and what they're up to. And, and they're able to kind of do things discreetly well, right out in the open. <laughs> true. But I also would point out that, you know, smartphones are almost ubiquitous devices now. Um, you know, I was I was doing a little jogging the other day around our ponds behind our house, and there were people sitting on the on the benches with their smartphones out, not talking to each other. There were just three, four people sitting on one bench. Everybody had their phone out doing something. So just as smartphones seemed a little creepy with the fact that you could record video and share it easily, I think Google Glass and devices like those similar path, they're going to be a little creep out factor initially and then people will get accustomed to them. 
um, there'll be some there'll be some congressional arm twisting and some concern over it, but I still think they're they're going to show up. Whether Google then goes in and says, "Okay, well, we're going to blur the faces of all the people we don't have explicit permission to record," just like they did in Street View, then that might be one solution too. Yeah. Well, I think the uh, I think the questions. I mean, I've I've read through the questions. I think the questions are good questions. I think they just they they sh they all should be answered. I mean, I'd like to know the answer to all these questions before I actually uh, was exposed to the these devices to know what kind of privacy implications they have. I think they're good questions, and I think Google should should answer them if not for Congress for the customers that are purchasing them and who they're being you know basically anybody in the line of fire of them well I, I applaud I applaud Google I mean I applaud the Congress for actually sending these questions to Google before the device was released I, I think too often in our field something gets out there bad things start to happen and then people say oh well we should talk about this. So I, I think it's it's good to be a little proactive in this case and say how are these issues going to be handled and, and get them up front uh, before they're rolled out to the, to the mass population so that people can make an informed decision. Well I don't know if they'll make informed decisions <laughs> but certainly talking about it now is a good idea. I'll agree with you there. Yeah. I, it doesn't hurt but you know a lot of things you know we won't know necessarily till it's all out there in the wild anyway. Yep, true enough. All right, any, anybody have anything else to say? No, I'm nope. still waiting on my neural implant. Oh, okay. It, it'll well, be coming. Give yeah, a couple it, more it'll years. be coming, yeah. My, my, Google <laughs> neural, my Google neural implant, yep. 2020, it'll be in 2020, sure. Awesome. I mean, that, that'll, right. That's that a good year. date for it. Yeah, 2020, like perfect eyesight, 2020. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, we'll wrap it up. Uh, thank you to Keith Watson and Mike Hill. I'm Preston White.